Hey guys, I've been wanting to do a quick video on optimizing your deep sky imaging system for optimal resolution for quite a while. And recently, Jim Slam posted a video titled Optimizing Your Imaging System for Your Getting Performance. I'm going to put a link to it right here, in which he follows his traditional analytical approach to reach a counterintuitive and somewhat controversial conclusion. So in this video, I'd like to look at the same problem, but from a slightly different angle, and you'll see that we'll reach a slightly different conclusion. So of course, when talking about resolution in deep sky imaging, there are a lot of factors to consider. So first of all, there is, of course, the optical resolution of the telescope itself. Then there's the image scale, the atmospheric seeing, the mount's guiding performance, and many other factors on which we'll touch briefly towards the end of the video. So let's start with the optical resolution. The Rayleigh criterion shows that the minimum angular spread that can be resolved by an imaging system is a function of the wavelength, which is lambda here, and the aperture of the telescope, basically the diameter of the objective lens or the primary mirror. So as an example, the theoretical optical resolution of an Explore Scientific 102 millimeter refractor, which is what one of the telescopes that uh, James owns, is about 1.3 arc second, and that of a Celestron 9 and a quarter inch Schmidt Cassegrain telescope is about half, a, half a, of an arc second. So of course, if you've ever done any kind of deep sky imaging, you know that there are many gating factors that prevent us from reaching this kind of numbers. So for all practical purpose, the diameter of the telescope is not really that important for resolution, except for gathering more light and therefore reducing the total exposure time or increasing the signal to noise ratio that you can attain. The second factor to consider is image scale, which is measured in arc second per pixel. So image scale is the amount of sky covered by one pixel on your camera sensor. So it's a function of the focal length of your telescope and the size of the pixels of your camera sensor. And here I included the formula that I obtained from uh, astropix.com. So for example, a ZWO is ASI 1600 coupled with an Export Scientific 102 has an image scale of 1.1 arc second per pixel. And if we look at the other end of the spectrum, so to speak, a Celestron 9 and a quarter inch SCT coupled with a ZWO ASI 294mm Pro in bin 1 mode has an image scale of 0.2 arc second per pixel. So the question is, what image scale should we choose? And it is an important decision to make. So to help us answer that question, let's briefly review the, the Nyquist or Nyquist Shannon sampling theorem, I don't know how you pronounce it, which when applied to imaging in two dimensions, states that the image scale should be roughly, at most, a third of the effective resolution of the imaging system. So for example, let's say that the smallest details that you can reasonably hope to resolve measure two arc second, your image scale should be at most about 0 0.6 or 0 0.7 arc second per pixel. And if your image scale is higher than that, you are what's called undersampled. What that means is that you lose some resolving power. And in that situation, a technique known as drizzling might be able to help. We'll also uh, briefly touch on that towards the end, but we won't cover that in detail in this video. And if you're above that number, you are what's called oversampled. So being oversampled is also not great because uh, your, your image um, signal to noise ratio or SNR will not be as high as it can be. And signal to noise ratio, SNR, is critically important when imaging deep sky objects. So this still does not an quite answer our question. So how do we know what the effective resolution of our system is? Shouldn't it be the theoretical optical resolution as expressed by the Rayleigh cri criterion? Well, no, not exactly. It's actually much higher than that. And the main culprit 
uh, is atmospheric seeing. So if you've ever looked at a star at high magnification through a telescope, you intuitively know what atmospheric seeing is and what it does to your images. What's important to understand is that unless you observe from, say, the top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii or in Chile, atmospheric seeing is likely the primary obstacle to improving the resolution of your images. So let's take a look at that next. Here I have a screenshot of the popular uh, PHD2 guiding software. And uh, PHD2 actually provides us uh, a, a measurement of guiding accuracy. So in this example, my total guiding accuracy is 0.61 arc second RMS. But it really does not matter that much because that is much less than the blurring effect caused by atmospheric seeing. Now, it is true that when, when the seeing is good, the PHG2 numbers have a tendency to get better. So people have a tendency to believe that this number also includes the effect of seeing, but that is completely incorrect. Look at this screenshot. The exposure time on my guide camera is set to one second. Now consider the fact that seeing changes the shape of a star thousands of times per second. So all PHD2 is really able to measure is the low frequency component of seeing, and of course any inaccuracies in your mount or guiding system. And that is what is captured by this number. Now, it's not completely illogical to think that the amplitude of the low frequency component of seeing is tied to the amplitude of the higher frequency components. And empirically, I've observed this myself to be true. So the PHD2 number can be used as a proxy to estimate the effect of atmospheric seeing. But that's about it. So don't give that number too much credence. One last thing to look for. It is good to have similar numbers in RA and DEC, otherwise you might end up with elongated stars. So how do we measure the combined impact of atmospheric seeing and guiding inaccuracies? Well, you can do that very easily by opening one of your images in PixInsight and by measuring the FWHM, or full width at half maximum, of stars using the dynamic PSF process. Now make sure to pick stars that are far from being saturated, but also don't pick stars that are too dim. So kind of in between. And in this example, I measured an average FWHM of 2.7 pixels, um, which amounts to about 2.4 arc second at my image scale of 0.89 arc second per pixel. So now that we have a way to measure the combined effect of atmospheric seeing and guiding inaccuracies, how can we make more educated decisions on our equipment? In my case, for example, I have a pretty good mount. I have an Ioptron CEM70 and, and it guides very well. And I am contemplating a new OTA and a new camera, maybe next year. So what combination should I consider? To help us with this, I made a little simulator using a software called GNU Octave, which is kind of a free and open source version of MATLAB, which is a very popular, albeit very expensive, uh, software used for mathematical simulations. I posted the code of my simulator on GitHub so you can check it out and play with it. So when you visit the, the GitHub page, make sure to review the entire README file. I explain how to install GNU Octave, um, how to install the necessary Octave packages, and how to run the simulator. I also provided a couple of screenshots along with some observations, um, which I am covering in greater detail in this video presentation. So when, when running a simulation with this tool, you'll need to edit the simulator.m file there are quite a few parameters you can play with. So for example, the aperture of the telescope, its central obstruction, its focal length, the wavelength of light, the size of the pixels of the camera sensor, the bit depth of the camera ADU, etc. So let's look at a few simulations now. Uh, please note that in the following examples, I set the critically important fuzz RMS arcsec parameter to 1.0 arcsecond 
and that gives me a FWHM of 2.4 arc second, which is what I measured in PixInsight. So this is the first example I wanted to show you guys. Um, so in this example, we're looking at an Explore Scientific 102 with a ZWO ASI 1600mm Pro. And as you can see, this system is not able to properly resolve two stars separated by 2.5 arc second. Now let's see what happens when using a camera with smaller pixels, like the ZWASI ASI 294mm Pro Bin 1 in bin one mode um, with the same telescope. And as you can see, the two stars are now getting resolved, although barely. And finally, in this last example, we, we see uh, that a Celestron 925 inch SCT used at F7 and coupled with a ZWASI 1600 mm Pro is able to quite easily resolve the two stars. So this is literally the opposite conclusion reached by James in his video. Now, in all fairness to James, I don't know how good or bad the seeing is at his location, but hopefully this gives you a slightly broader picture of the situation, and at least now you have a tool that you can use to, to choose your equipment wisely. So here are a few things that we've observed. First, for my seeing conditions and for my mount's ability to guide accurately, I can benefit from a longer focal length telescope, like a Celestron 9 quarter inch SCT with a reducer, when using a camera that has pixels measuring 3.76 microns, which seems like the standard for most affordable CMOS cameras these days. And it is actually what I have in my uh, ASI 533 MC Pro today. Another thing that we've covered is that atmospheric seeing is almost always the primary degrading factor in your ability to resolve fine details in deep sky imaging. In my case, I routinely guide at 0.4 or 0.5 arc second RMS, so I am pretty confident that my mount is not the gating factor for me. And finally, if you have a longer focal length telescope, and you are oversampled, don't despair. You can bin two by two, for example, and that will help you recover some SNR uh, without necessarily impacting the resolution of your imaging system. Even better than binning, look for cameras with larger pixels, if you can find them, uh, although they can be quite expensive because it seems like the semiconductor industry is focusing more and more on making the pixels smaller for the consumer market. And so cameras with larger pixels are likely to be made in much smaller batches. And that is why they are so much more expensive nowadays. And there are many other factors to consider when optimizing the resolution of your imaging system. I listed a few of them here. I won't cover them in this video, but these are things to look into if you want to make the most out of your equipment. All right, to conclude, remember to do your own research ask questions, tinker with your own equipment, understand what your goals are, and don't just blindly believe everything you read in the forums or here on YouTube, not even in this video. Until next time, my name is Julian. Thank you for watching.